Hi everyone. Today we are going to go uh, over the bones and skeletal tissues. First, let's talk about the basic structure, the types and locations of the human skeletal uh, tissues. Human skeleton is initially made up of cartilage and fibrous membranes. So uh, the skeletal cartilage is therefore made of highly resilient molded cartilage tissue which consists of primarily water because as we know cartilage tends to um, absorb and retain water so that gives much a resilient for this skeletal cartilage. Also uh, the skeletal cartilage it does not contain uh, blood vessels or nerves. And the perichondrium is found outside of the skeletal cartilage. It is formed by the dense irregular connective tissue. And this surrounds the cartilage and serves like a little girdle. And the perichondrium, because of its existence, is resist outward expansion when cartilage get compressed and also it contains the blood vessels for nutrients delivery to the cartilage. Cartilage is made up of chondrocytes and the cells, uh, the chondrocytes are the cells which is encased in small cavities, the lacunae, uh, and the lacunae exist in a jelly-like matrix, we call it as the extracellular matrix. There are three types of cartilage, um, highline cartilage. It provides the support, flexibility, and the resilience. And this is the most abundant type. And uh, the fiber that the highline cartilage has is the fine collagen fibers, and it exists only in the matrix. For the naked eye uh, or the microscopic structure, like just the light microscope, you don't see these fine collagen fibers in the matrix. That's why you see kind of a clear uh, matrix in the microscope. The highline cartilage can be seen at the articular joints, costal um, uh, areas, which is the costal cartilage in the ribs, in the respiratory system, in the larynx, uh, the nasal cartilage at the uh, nose tip, you can find the highline cartilage. The elastic cartilage, it's similar to the highline cartilage, but it contains elastic fibers and it's able to withstand the repeated bending because of its elasticity. So you would think like the areas that you find this elastic cartilage, like the external ear or uh, the epiglottis. In um, the, uh, it's in what well, epiglottis is part of um, the respiratory tract system, um, so on. The other type of cartilage would be the fibrocartilage, which consists of parallel rows of chondrocytes alternating with thick collagen fibers. And this thick collagen fibers, it has a great tensile trend, strength. And um, this fibrocartilage, you can see where the places which are subjected to both pressure and strength. Uh, stretch and especially you would find them in the menisci of the knee, um, the vertebral discs, those are the examples. So here you would see like different kinds of cartilage um, skeletal system uh, which you would see like here the hyaline cartilage in the ribs, uh, the joints um, like that and then um, the uh, elastic cartilage in the epiglottis as well as the external auditory uh, canal and uh, the fibrocartilage at the uh, symphysis pubis and so on as well as the meniscus in the knee.
The other important aspect would be that you need to identify how the cartilage growth happens. The cartilage growth happen in two ways. Either it could be in the appositional growth or it could be the interstitial growth. So in the appositional growth, what will happen is the cartilage forming cells in the perichondrium, they starts to secrete the matrix against the external phase of the existing cartilage. So because of that, the new matrix laid down on the surface of the cartilage itself. On the other hand, the interstitial growth in there, what will happen is the chondrocytes within the lacunae divide and they secrete new matrix and expanding cartilage from inside to out. So then in that case, the new matrix is going to form within the cartilage with related to the interstitial growth. And typically, cartilage growth ends during the adolescence when the skeleton stops growing and cartilage can get calcified and then they can hard, uh, become hard because the calcium deposits can be deposited um, due to certain conditions, uh, which is then we called um, calcified cartilage and you have to remember the calcified cartilage due to certain conditions uh, we don't call it as bones at that point let's look at the functions of the bones when you think about the skeletal system it has several functions and of course, skeletal system consists of bones. It um, we all together consider the functions of bone here. So uh, the first one would be the support function, and it does also provides a protection function. For instance, um, the rib cage it protects the lungs, and also it provides the movement because you have the limbs and the girdles that is involved with the movement process. And also it, can, uh, it provides a function of mineral and growth factor storage because lots of calciums are deposited in the bone. So it's like a reservoir when the blood calcium levels are low, then you can uh, get calcium back into the blood. Also, uh, it consists of sites to form blood cells. Uh, we call it hematopoiesis. So blood cell formation is one of the functions of the bones. Fat storage, um, the marrow cavity, you can have a yellow marrow, which is um, you have fat depositions over there. And also it can provide the hormonal production function. Looking at the bones itself, there are 206 named bones in the human skeleton, which we can divide into two groups based on their location, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton, it forms the long axis of the body um, and it includes the skull, vertebral column and the rib cage. The appendicular skeleton, it consists of bones of the upper and the lower limbs and the girdles. Girdles, they attach limbs to the axial skeleton. Bones are also classified according to one of their shapes. It could be either long bone or a short bone or a flat bone or an irregular bone. Um, with related to the long bones, the characteristic feature would be they're longer than their width. So, for instance, all the limb bones, um, most of the limb bones are included into the long bones. Short bones, on the other hand, like the cute shaped bones, for instance, if you have seen in the wrist and the ankle, you would see like cuboid uh, bones. So those are the short bones. And a special type, some bones exist within the tendons where we call them as sesamoid bones. And patella is a type of a sesamoid bone. 
um, the short bones, they could vary in size and number in different individuals. The flat bones, on the other hand, they're thin and they're flat. It could be slightly curved, for instance, like the skull bones. You can see like that little bit of curved. curved. The sternum, scapulae, ribs, and most of skull bones included into flat bones. The irregular bones, they're complicated in shapes. The best examples would be the vertebrae and the hip bones, the coxal bone. So here it shows what we have discussed here. The long bones uh, showing the um, upper limb and the lower limb bones, humerus, ulna and um, radius, femur, tibia and fibula and also like you see the metacarpals over here and the digits they are part of the long bones here the tarsals and the phalanges also long bones and here you can find the irregular bones the vertebra and also the three bones in the hip bone which is the ilium ischium and the pubic bone then the flat bones, the manubrium sterni um, here, um, as well as some skull bones, you would see them as fat. The short bones, which is cuboid, the ankle bones, and the wrist bones. So all in all, when you look at the structure, bones are considered as organs because they contain different types of tissues. They contained um, the um, nervous tissue inside of it. They contains like the connective tissue, the blood vessels. So all in all, we can use it as an, as an organ. So bone um, osseous, uh, the name implies bone. Um, tissue predominates in the bones, uh, but also it contains the cartilage, fibrous connective tissue, muscle cells attached to it, the epithelial cells in its blood vessels, so on. So that's why it's collectively um, we can consider as an organ. Three levels of structure with related to the bone we can study. Um, we can study their gross structure, we can study their microscopic structure, as well as their chemical structure as well. So the gross structure, all bones consist of compact bones sandwiching the spongy bone. So let's look at this. What is the compact bone? What is the spongy bone? It's like? So the compact bone, um, it's dense outer layer on it is the dense outer layer on every bone that appears smooth and solid. So when you take a bone, you would see the outer area that is the compact bone. The spongy bone, it's made up of honeycomb of small needle-like little flat pieces um, inside and we call them as trabeculae. When you cut a bone, you would see inside is much more little beams. Uh, directing into different directions. So that is the spongy bone fat. And the little beams, we call them as trabecular bones or spongy bones. We can refer to, to as trabecular bones. So in living bones, the open spaces between these trabeculae are filled with red or yellow bone marrow. So um, the structure of the, uh, we previously discussed the structure of the long bones. Here now we are going to see the structure of the short and the irregular and the flat bones. So they're not cylindrical and uh, unlike the long bones, they don't have a shaft or any expanded ends. Uh, they consist of thin plates of spongy bone. We call it as a diplo. So when you encounter the word diplo, you have to uh, remember now it's talking about the spongy bone. And uh, it's been covered by the compact bone. So all in all, the structure would be different, but maybe the amount of component would be very depending on where you find it or the type of bone. So compact bone sandwiched between the connective tissue membranes. So there are 
two membranes sandwiched the compact bone as well. The outer layer, we called it as a periosteum, that is a double layered uh, membrane, the double layered structure, uh, layered structure, the endomastic endosteum is the one which you find inside of the compact bone and the bone marrow is scattered throughout this spongy bone uh, there's no well-defined marrow cavity uh, compared to the long bones um, in the short or irregular or flat bones the highland cartilage covers the areas of these bones, whereas they form movable joints within their neighboring bones. So that is the unique feature with related to the movable bones, as you saw it in the uh, previous skeleton. So here it shows the flat bone, which consists of spongy bone over here. And it's been sandwiched by the compact bone over here and another compact bone over here. So in the compact bone, you see the outside, the outer part would be the periosteum, which is find it at the periphery, and the endosteum is found inside. And here, of course, it shows the little beams, which we refer to as the trabeculae in the spongy form, and they are in all over different directions. So let's look at the structure of the typical long bone. All long bones, they have a shaft, we refer to as the diaphysis, and the bone ends, which we call them as epiphysis and membranes. So the diaphysis, it is a tubular structure and it forms the long axis of the bones. And it does have a thick collar of compact bone which surrounds its central medullary cavity and this diaphysis is filled with yellow marrow in adults. The epiphysis is the ends of the long bone which consists of compact bone externally and spongy form internally. So the articular cartilage, the highland cartilage, covers the articular surface of the epiphysis. In adults, the epiphysis and the diaphysis is separated by uh, a line called epiphyseal line, or sometimes uh, in childhood we refer to this as the epiphyseal plate, um, and it's been referred to as the metaphysis. So uh, in childhood, this epiphyseal plate is composed of hyaline cartilage where bone growth uh, occurs. So this is what it's been mentioned a few minutes ago. You would find the uh, epiphysis over here. The epiphyseal surface is being covered by the hyaline cartilage you would find the diaphysis over here. And the metaphysis or the epiphyseal plate is in between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. And in the long bone, you would find the compact bone and inside the marrow cavities formed by this trabeculated spongy bone. And here you would see the different architectural structure. You do see some kind of a design structure over here. Um, and you would see the spongy bone, the trabeculase, and the blood vessels traveling to this trabeculase. The membranes um, are the two types, periosteum and the endosteum. So the periosteum is white and it is double layered membrane which covers the external surfaces except the joint surface if you would remember the joint surface is being covered with hyaline cartilage the fibrous layer is the outer layer which consists of dense irregular connective tissue and it consists of fibers called Sharpies fibers and that will attach the bone securely to the bone matrix itself. 
The osteogenic layer is the inner layer of the periosteum, which contains the primitive osteogenic stem cells, and it gives rise to most of all bone cells except the bone-destroying cells, the osteoclasts. And also the periosteum, it contains many nerve fibers and blood vessels and continue on to the shaft through nutrient foramen uh, openings. Foramen is a hole, so um, the nutrient artery can go through this nutrient foramen. And periosteum anchors points for tendons and the ligaments as well. The endosteum is a delicate one membrane um, structure and it covers the internal bone surface. Um, it covers the trabeculae of the spongy bone and it lines the canals that pass through compact bone. So like the periosteum, it contains the osteogenic cells which can differentiate into other bone cells. So here you would see the periosteum actually you would see it's a double membrane not obvious seen here but you do see the sharpies fibers which connect the periosteum into the bone matrix The hematopoietic tissues in the bones is important as well. You have heard these words before. The red marrow, which is found within the trabecular cavities of the spongy bone of long bones and diplo, uh, which is diplo means the spongy bone of spongy bones and um, of the flat bones, such as the sternum. In new bones, the medullary cavities of the diaphysis and all spongy bones, it contains the red marrow. But in adults, the red marrow is located in heads of the femur and the humerus, but most active areas of the hematopoiesis are flat bone diplo and some irregular bones such as the hip bone. So that's why if you would know that if you have to take the red marrow for disease purposes checking, you can uh, take some samples, red bone marrow from your hip bone because that is where the uh, bone formation is, uh, the hematopoiesis is happening in adults. With time, the yellow marrow can convert to the red if uh, the person becomes anemic. So, Otherwise, uh, the area of those irregular bones and the flat bones, the rest of the bones, the marrow cavities filled with fat, um, the yellow marrow. So with the demand or with the disease conditions, certain disease conditions, this yellow marrow can convert into the red marrow. Also, when you learn about bones, the bone markings are important. So bone markings are the sites of the muscle, ligament and tendon attachment on the external surfaces. The areas involved in joint formation or channels for blood vessels and nerves. And the bone markings include three types of markings. They could be at the projections or depressions or and openings. So the projection would be outward bulge of the bone and it may be due to the increased stress from the muscle pull or is could be a modification to form joints. The depressions, they are like bowl or groove-like structures cut out that can serve as passageways for vessels and nerves or they play a role in joints. The openings, they are the whole of channel in bones which serves as the passageway to the blood vessels and the nerves. So here in this table 6.1 it gives the different definitions um, or describe nicely what is a tuberosity, what is a crest, what is a trochanter, the tubercle and so on which you can um, easily identify when you're studying the bones if you know the meanings of these words, for instance, like what does it mean by the condyle and so on. With related to the microscopic anatomy, uh, there are five major cell types of 
each which is specialized to form the basic structure of the bones so they are the osteogenic cells the osteoblast the osteocytes bone lining cells and the osteoclasts all of the cells derived from the embryonic connective tissue except the osteoclasts so osteoclasts they derive from the same hematopoietic stem cells which differentiate into macrophages so they're not derived from the embryonic connective tissue cells so osteogenic cells, they are also called as the osteoprogenitor cells and they are mitotically apt stem cells in the membranous periosteum and the endosteum. So they are flattened in shape or squamous uh, cell shaped and when they stimulate, they can differentiate into osteoblast or bone lining cells and some can remain as osteogenic stem cells. The osteoblast, on the other hand, they bone forming cells, which secretes the unmineralized bone matrix, which we called it as the osteoid. So when you hear the word osteoid, you have to remember it's made up of collagen and calcium binding proteins. The collagen of it makes up about 90% of the bone protein. Osteoblasts, they're actively mitotic and when it's completely surrounded by the matrix uh, which they have secreted, it will no longer start to divide and then become an osteoclast. The osteocytes, they are the mature bone cells and they're located in lacunae and they no longer divide and they maintain the bone matrix and they can act as a stress or strain sensor. They respond to the mechanical stimuli and to increase bones or bone or the weightlessness and then they communicate this sense information to osteoblast and osteoclast um, so the bone remodeling can occur in certain conditions. The bone lining cells, they are flat cells found on the bone surfaces uh, where the remodeling is not going on and it's believed to also help to maintain the matrix along with the osteocytes. The external bone surface we call them as the periosteal cells the internal bone um, the internal surfaces of the bone we call them as the endosteal cells the cells located in those the other tell cell type would be the osteoclast they derive from the same macro hematopoietic stem cells um, that become macrophages they are giant multinucleated cells found in uh, bones and they involved with breakdown of bones we call them as the bone resorption when they are active the cells they're located in a depression and the resorption is happening um, yeah, the location that they stay is called the resorption base these cells they have some ruffled borders and serve to increase the surface area for enzyme degradation of the bone so you would see here lots of ruffled borders and also um, it helps to seal off this area of the bone resorption for surrounding matrix these ruffled borders and um, in addition to increase the cell surface area, it helps with sealing off the area of bone resorption from the surrounding matrix. With related to the microscopic anatomy, once we study the cells, then we need to identify its organization. So um, you will encounter when you're reading the word osteon or the Havasian system. An osteon is the structural unit of the compact bone and it consists of an elongated cylinder which runs parallel to the long axis of the bone. And functionally, it we say that it acts as a tiny weight-bearing pillars. 
The osteon cylinder consists of several rings of the bone matrix called lamellae, that is the little pegs. And these lamellae contain collagen fibers and these fibers can run in different directions in addition to the rings, in ad adjacent rings. And um, they can withstand stress and resist twisting. Bone soles you can find in between these collagen fibers, which gives the strength to uh, the, these collagen fibers. After this osteon, um, you would find the inside of this osteon, you would find some um, thing called the central canal or the Haversian canal. It runs through the core of the osteon, as you can see in here. And uh, also, you will find like perforating canals or Walkman canals, which line the endosteum and occur at right angles to the central canal. And these perforating canals, they connect the vessels and nerves of the periosteum, the medullary cavity, and the central cavity. The canals and the canaliculi, um, they are connect different lacunae. So lacunae, they are called little hollows. They're small cavities which contains the osteocytes. And canaliculi are hair-like canals which connects the lacunae to each other and to the central canal. And the formation of canaliculi happen when the osteoblast secretes the bone matrix. And um, what they do is they maintain uh, the contact with each other osteocytes via cells, projections, and gap junctions. And when the matrix is going to harden, the cells are trapped in the canaliculi. Um, form and they started to communicate with the um, different uh, little channels. The interstitial lamellae are the part that which is not included to the osteon because osteon is the basic structural unit of the bone and in between you would see like some incomplete uh, parallel lines going on like lamellae and they would be part of this interstitial osteon. The circumferential lamellae is the other one which you find just deep to the periosteum but superficial to the endosteum and um, these uh, lamellae they extend around the entire surface of the diaphysis and this would help bone to resist the twisting. So here you would see uh, different aspects that we have talked so far. Here you would see an osteon. If you start from here to here, it's an osteon. Here to here, it's an osteon, the basic structural unit. And inside you would see the central canal and different lamellae, and their direction of fibers would vary. And um, you would see several osteons arranged circularly and form this long bone. And this is circumferential lamellae, which locates just beneath the periosteum and away from the endosteum. Let's talk about the spongy bone. So spongy bone, it appears poorly organized, but it's actually organized along the lines of the stress to help bone resist any stress. And strabiculis, they confirm the strength to the bone. No osteons are present, uh, but trabiculi do contain some irregularly arranged lamellae and osteocytes interconnected by the canaliculi. The capillaries in the endosteum, it supplies the nutrients to the spongy bone. So here, once again, you would see the spongy bone sandwiched between the compact bone and you do see uh, lots of trabeculae in this spongy bone. 
The next important topic would be the chemical composition of the bone. So bone is made up of both organic and inorganic components. Inorganic components include bone cells and osteoids. So it includes the osteogenic cells, osteoblast, osteoclast, bone lining cells, and the osteoid. The osteoid, which makes up one third of the organic bone matrix, is secreted by the osteoblast. Osteoid, it consists of ground substances, proteoglycans and the glycoproteins are considered as the ground substances and osteos consist of collagen fibers which gives rise to the highest tensile strength and flexibility of the bone. And also um, there are bonds in the um, compact bone, we call them as the sacrificial bonds and they're happening in between the collagen molecules and the sacrificial bones, the, the tendencies, like they can break and reform uh, the bonds, uh, which means the collagen keeps extending it and absorbing the energy without rupturing the backbone of the structure when they have these sacrificial bonds. The inorganic component, 65% of the bone mass, is formed by inorganic component and it consists mainly of the tiny calcium phosphate crystals in and around the collagen fibers. And they're responsible for hardness and resistance to the compression. So um, this is just the basics for the bone. And in my next lecture, we'll talk about the other aspects of the bones and the skeletal tissue. Thank you.